Hi, 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 America podcast. Robert Evans. That you. Behind the bastards. Yeah, we're um we're coming in. Ooh, this this one's been rough. There's been a lot of disasters behind the start of this episode. Behind the bastards podcast where we talk about the worst people in all of history. First off, um, I got the time wrong. Uh, our 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 guest today. We're doing a reverse bastards where yeah, someone reads coup. me a story about a terrible person. It's another coup. We have a lot of coups. We're like you know Guatemala, most of Latin America throughout like the '60s to present day. Actually, um. We're a lot like all that, um, and and my coup guest today uh, is is our our friend Christopher from Worst Year Ever. You know him on Twitter as Ice Must Be Destroyed Guy. Yeah. Um, how's how's it going, Christopher? It's 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 going pretty good. I have I have successfully come out come out in charge of this this warlord struggle. Yeah, successfully yeah. successfully taking control of Beijing. If, and I it will feels hold it good. for about two hours, which is about the average time that people hold Beijing in this period. <laughs> Very excited. <laughs> well, you've given us a little bit of a hint about the episode for today. I want to start this by noting that you are in Chicago, um, which I thought meant you were in the Eastern Standard Time, because I assume everything east of Arizona exists in the same time zone unless it's Texas. And that is apparently not the case. No, uh, which for some I'm reason, Chicago about. and Texas are the same time zone, which makes I'm absolutely livid. no sense. Livid. I mean, um, I think yeah. You know, I haven't spent much time in 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 southern in southern Illinois, but you know, I I, I think I think uh, if you broke off a bunch I of southern Illinois, grew up there for a little while. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not like that different. I just want to let the listeners think. know that as we were testing our levels for this recording, I went. Who's airplane? Is there somebody? Is there an airplane flying over somebody's uh, uh, house right now? And it was just Robert's foot massager that he <laughs> thought he could use while we recorded this podcast. And it was worth a shot, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. Look, uh, you know, it's impressive, horrifying. <laughs> It wouldn't be the first time I keep doing things that create odd noises. Like a couple of weeks ago, we had an episode where there was like a clinking sound the whole episode and people kept being, what is it? And it was a moon clip of 44 plus P ammunition for my gigantic revolver that I was playing with as a desk toy. <laughs> um, I removed that and then I got the foot machine. So it's just just a disaster over here at all times. You're, um, you're a professional, but you know, I'm a professional. Today, this today is literally are, the to, only thing I do for money now. Today you are not our host. You are a guest. Today I'm not. So Christopher, do you want to tell us so, what we're talking about? Want to want to get started here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Robert. Yeah, I, want, I want to ask you something. How do you Come feel about us. warlords? Oh, I'm very pro. Um, I hope to be one someday. The healthcare seems to be shit, but you usually don't live long enough for that to really matter. Um, I already own a Mauser C96, which a lot of my favorite warlords were during the Chinese civil wars, uh, and that was a popular gun there. So I feel like I'm already halfway to being a proper warlord. Um, yeah, it seems like a good time. Um, I don't, yeah. I don't really know any downsides to being a warlord. Well, sometimes, sometimes you get assassinated by the Japanese. Yes, which is, seems 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 to be the biggest one. I'm already very worried about that. So yeah. It's like it's a it's a constant problem mm-hmm. in the field. Oh. All right, so this th- this week we are doing Zhang Zongchang, who is, you know, ch- he's probably China's most famous warlord, but he's one hundred percent the warlord who is having the most fun in this period. Oh hell yeah, that's the guy I like. Then yeah, yeah, he's 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 having a ball. Uh, you gotta make history a- work for you, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that name again? Chong Zong Chong. Chong Zong Chong. Okay. Chong. 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 Yeah. Okay. Just call, call him Chong. We'll, 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 we'll work from and, there. And, and I'm, I'm pretty good on Chong. Okay. Yeah. I can do we, this. We can do this. Yeah. All right. he's, he's, he's also known as the dog meat warlord. Which, okay. I don't know. Yeah, we, we I don't will, know if I like that part with three dogs in the room with me right now. But yeah. Okay. So okay. We, we, we will get to this, but it's not. He doesn't eat dogs. This is this is un- entirely unrelated to the consumption of dogs, which is okay. Again, pretty incredible considering that he's called the dog meat. Yeah, warlord, yeah, yeah. yeah right. I was assuming dog meat general. <laughs> some eating dog meat probably no, played not, into that. No, not not from the eating dog meat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's let's get into this. All right. Chong was born on February thirteenth, eighteen eighty one, in a rural village in Shandong Province. His family was incredibly poor. Later in life, Chong will claim not to have known what a pillow was growing up, and Jesus. Yeah, you know, I mean, Jung, Jung is a character where there's 
there, there's approximately 10 billion sort of myths floating around about him, but I actually believe this one. Like his his family is poor by the standards of 1800s rural China, which is you know not a great place I to mean, be in the beginning. That's a whole new benchmark for poverty. Is like what is a pillow? Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's something. Well, I'm okay. Jesus. <laughs> All yeah. right. His, his so father he's... his father played trumpet at funerals and worked as sort of a barber who shaves people's head for religious ceremonies. And his I'm mother... seeing why he was poor. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah. And, and, you know, and his mom does like small time ritual magic for money. Yeah. And, you know, as, as you can pick up on, work is incredibly unstable and infrequent for both of them. Now, now this is the era of child labor. And I mean, okay, it's still the era of child labor, but it was really the era of child labor back then. And this means that Zhang started his first job when he was either 12 or 13. And his, his first job is, it's kind of cute. He he, he would accompany, when, when his dad would play trumpet at funerals, he would like go along with him and play cymbals. Okay, okay, getting into yeah. the family business, which is shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting into the terrible family business it's that disaster. does not pay enough for pillows. Good call. <laughs> Nope. Good call. <laughs> yeah. Other, right. other other than the sort of whole crushing poverty part, uh, we we don't know a huge amount about his family life. Other than that, he absolutely adores his mother, which seems to be why when his mother left his father to move to Manchuria, John goes with his mother. And it, it, yeah. it, it's sort of unclear why this happens, but what what most likely seems to happen is that the family just wasn't making enough money to support the three of them. So Zhang's mother took him to the provincial capital to go look for work there. This is the first similarity between this Chinese warlord and Dr. Phil. And I'm curious as to whether or not it will be the last. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, you know, I I was thinking about uh, that, about that when I was writing this and (laughs) I don't know, there's, 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 there's a little bit there. There's a little bit there, except I don't know, different. Dr. Phil doesn't end up in the army. And I, and I I think that's the big difference here. I mean, I I can imagine him as a bandit, but. I can imagine Dr. Phil is a bandit for sure. He is a kind of bandit, a spiritual kind, though. I think this yeah. guy's actually going to work out to be much more ethical than Dr. Phil. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he moves with his mom to Manchuria. Yeah. And, and while he's there, uh, he's, about, he's about 15 at this point. He starts working as a servant in a gambling house, which... Gives him his first exposure to this this class of petty criminal that's you know, most of his youth is going to be spent cavorting with these people. And this pisses off the local gentry and they just expel him from the city. Him specifically, not the criminals he's like hanging out with. Why do yeah, they hate no. him more than these other people? Yeah, my, my, my guess on that is that so the, the actual local criminals probably have some kind of political power and he just doesn't. And so I can't really do anything to them, but they just like, yeah, we'll, we'll kick we'll kick you out of town. Okay, and so right. you know, okay, Weird. so so and so w- once once there, uh, he he does the thing that most young men do when they have no jobs and are thrown into the countryside. He becomes a bandit. Hell yeah! All right, <laughs> so so this this guy's this guy's moving up in the world. He's doing better than his dad already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we for for some obvious reasons we know very little about what he was doing as a bandit. Um. But we do know that his mother, who's now who's now completely on her own, started starts to sort of date a series of men for the financial support. And eventually a guy she was dating murders her previous ex, and the guy gets sent to prison. But because this is, and I cannot emphasize this enough, an incredibly fucked up patriarchal society, she also gets exiled from the city for the murder, even okay. though she had no involvement <laughs> in it. Okay. City leaders just went, Yeah, we're we're exiling you too. And, <laughs> Yeah, your boyfriend murdered somebody. You got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's the kind of society. Okay. Oh, don't I mean, worry. It gets worse. <laughs> that was basically the whole world at this point. So, yeah. <sighs> okay. And so, yeah. So, so once she's kicked out, she, she dates like she's able to date one more guy and she scrapes up enough money to go back to Zhang's father. But uh, when she gets back to him, he's flat broke and sells her to a grain merchant for some millet, which is apparently a thing you could do at this time. Wow. You can you can just sell your wife to a grain merchant for I millet. Mean, <laughs> like, I would condemn him for this, but this is the, this is the best financial investment he's made in his life. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was a wholesale merchant, so maybe you got a good deal. Yeah, I don't he know. really needed that fucking millet. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, I shouldn't so, be laughing. This is horrible, but like, well, okay, Jesus. I say this. So, so this is just like such a bleak story. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so at th- 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 this point, Zhang's mom just disappears from the historical record for twenty years. But but don't worry about her. She is the only person in the story who's getting a happy ending. And like, frankly, after all of this shit, she's like one of the people who deserves it the most. Yeah. So yeah, I, Zhang's mother will return later. Um, now. Zhang is banditing for about two years, um, but eventually he's able to get a relatively stable job in Manchuria in 1899. And because Manchuria is going to play a pretty big role in this story, I'm going to give a sort of brief introduction to it. Manchuria is geographically, it's, it's in the very far northeast part of China. Like it's kind of like it's China's version of New England, except imagine if instead of bordering Canada, it bordered like Russia, Korea and was five minutes away from Japan. Mm hmm. So, you know, and, and, and when be, being in the middle of China, Korea, Russia, and Japan means that there's just basically every empire is constantly fighting for control over it. And this also means that, that all of the empires wind up putting just an enormous amount of capital into Manchuria's sort of manufacturing belts and railway systems. And Zhang, Zhang's never able to get one of like the, the really highly paid stable jobs in in uh Manchuria's arsenal, which is one of the largest sort of weapons manufacturers in China. But what he is able to get is a job on the Chinese Eastern Railway. Okay. Now, now the Chinese the Chinese Eastern Railway is is a Russian concession. It's it's one of the concessions that the sort of the Qing dynasty has been giving out to like the various empires that it loses wars to in the sort of nineteenth and twentieth centuries. And the, the way these things work is that like okay, so when, when you give concession to a country you get like if you're if you're like, say like Britain, you get you get a chunk of land and you just control that part, like that part of China, like it's just mm-hmm. under your control. You, you get your own, you can impose your own legal system. They have their own police force, and yeah, just, Germany like, does this too them. to one of their port cities. Yeah, 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 and there, there, this happens all over the country. I and mean, there's there's uh, there's a there's a really big and famous like French concession that's just like a third of Shanghai. Um, this this is all going to become important later when the sort of just absolutely horrific treatment of Chinese workers in these concessions boils over into just full scale conflict. But for right now, the most important thing about Chong's job on the concession is that it gives him gives him his first real contact with Russia. Mm. Okay. Now, for, for for all sort of like lack of education, and and it's it's really questionable whether Zhang really ever got more than like two years of schooling. He's extremely good at learning languages. Okay. And he he like almost immediately is able to learn Russian and is able to very quickly leverage this job once the sort of wa- railway work dries up to become the chief foreman at a gold mine in Siberia, which was basically because he was the only Chinese worker who could speak Russian. And the the Russians trusted him enough to give him a gun, which would turn out to be great for Zhang and an absolute fiasco for literally every other human being in China. But it goes great for him. I mean that's that is a story you see a lot in this colonial period is like the folks who make bank and are really successful and often wind up basically owning huge chunks of the world are usually polyglots. And it's the same with the imperial powers too. like all of these British colonizers, like the dudes who are actually doing the colonizing tend to be people who just like pick up language because it's like your number one asset in this period of time, other than shamelessness and sociopathy um, is being able to talk to everybody. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's you know, and it's really like if you're a Chinese worker in this period, this is like one of this or being a really good bandit are basically like the only two real ways you could even sort of work yourself up in the world. And you know, Zhang said Zhang is doing does does pretty well for himself here. He yes, yeah, so, but but you know, one 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 day he, he's working at this mining camp, and the camp gets attacked by a bear. And <laughs> okay, I, I don't know if you know about this, Robert. I'm I'm just psyched that a bear attack is coming into this story. <laughs> yeah, this has right. everything that I want in a story so far. So please, all right. I, I don't know if you know this, Robert. Bears, they're really big. Yeah, they're pretty pretty sizable. Yeah, they're they're extremely strong, and and their mass means that unless you have a very very large gun, you're not going to bring it down with one shot. Yeah, I have a bear gun, and it weighs like four and a half pounds. It's a <laughs> yeah. handgun. Yeah. What? Continue. Yeah, I have just, what? Just, just continue. You might need to shoot a bear, Sophie. <laughs> Do you want me to not be able to shoot a bear if a bear attacks? I, I, Christopher. Bear, look, bear, bears can tip over seven hundred pound steel like dumpsters. It, it, it's, not, it's not even that much effort for them. They can. My just Prius knock them is over. only like seven hundred pounds, Sophie. 
I'm still scarred from the the guy who's running in the recall election in California who's been using a bear as a prop in his ads. So it's, 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 I'm triggered. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so <laughs> this bear comes into camp. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Jong, Jong, okay, he has this incredibly dinky 1800s rifle and he just easily kills this bear. So like, he's got extremely it with, like, calmly. nailed it through the heart or the eye or something. Yeah, so, it, which, I couldn't yeah. find a description of it, which is sort of wild. I mean, it, it's probably, if it's a mid-1800s gun, I'm certain, like, the best it could be is probably something like a Dreiss needle gun, um, which is kind of an early pre-cartridge bolt-action rifle, if it is a cartridge rifle. I mean, if it is a cartridge rifle, the good news is that it's probably a fairly large round, because most of the, it was usually, like, kind of like 30 out 6 or somewhere in that ballpark. Um, but I'm going to guess the fact that this is the late 1800s in China means that he's not using like there's a decent chance it's a black powder. Anyway, yeah, it's that, that that's a heck of a thing to be able to do with the kind of weapon he probably was packing. Yeah, and this, you know, this this has a, a fairly predictable reaction on everyone else there. And he, he just immediately gets this like cult following among the workers because he just, you know, murdered this bear like extremely easily. And, you know, and th- this, this is sort of a point where y- you start to see the things that are going to make him a really good soldier. Because I mean, he's, he's remarkably calm under pressure. He's an incredibly good shot. And he's also incredibly charismatic, which is important for a guy who is, and in estimates vary here, this dude is somewhere between six foot six and seven feet tall. Holy shit. Yeah, he's tall as fuck. <laughs> like he's, and he's tall. He's that tall growing up impoverished in rural China in the 1800s, which is wild <laughs> yeah it's, it's <laughs> unbelievable it's just... that's huge for people who grow up in the united states with access to all of the protein they could possibly want that is oh god <laughs> yeah he's, <laughs> he's an absolute monster and yeah you know like like at this point like it's kind of hard not to be sympathetic to him i mean this is you know yeah, he's I mean, shooting is... bears he's a giant he's a bear shooting giant bandit polyglot he's pretty rad <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he loves his mom. Like, it's great. Yeah. And, you know, because this is behind the bastards, this is where everything immediately starts to go to shit. Oh, okay. Hell yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, this is this is like the moment where Saddam is 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 robbing his or is threatening his high school principal at gunpoint yeah. Yeah. before Saddam turns bad. <laughs> this is it. This is the part where you're like, tell me something bad. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's go. So in, in 1911, a revolution toppled the ruling Qing dynasty and replaced it with a republic led by Yuan Shikai, a man who's sole qualification for this job is that he has the largest army in China when the fighting stops. I mean, what other qualifications would there be for this job? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, for, for, for exactly one day, Sun Yat-sen, a man yeah. with actual real political qualifications, was in charge. And then he was like, this guy, Yuan, is the only person with an army large enough to hold the country together. So we're just going to give it to him. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yep. Yuan winds up writing this country and he... It's a, it's a disaster. Uh, he, you know, he starts in 1911. It, he, he's basically lurching from crisis to crisis. There's multiple rebellions against him until in late 1915, he makes one of the most baffling and disastrous decisions anyone has ever made in human history. He convenes an assembly to declare himself emperor. Mm. Now, okay. now, again, this is a guy who is in power. Literally, the only reason he's in power is because of a revolution, the sole point of which was getting rid of the monarchy. Mm-hmm. And Yuan looks around at the country, he's just collapsing around him, and he goes, I know what will unite the nation behind me, declaring myself emperor. Yeah. Completely scans. No flaws with this plan. Are you going to tell me this doesn't go well? Now, to his credit, Yuan did briefly unite the entire country, because basically all of it immediately goes into revolt to drive him out. And, you know, he, he... kind of remarkably holds on for about three months before deciding that he wasn't going to be emperor after all and politely asking everyone to please stop revolting so we could go back to the business of running the country and you know kind of said that we don't know whether this would have worked or not because three months after he abdicates he dies of an ermia okay and with his death in 1916 begins what is known in chinese history as the warlord period yeah, this is what that game um, where you stab a bunch of people to death was about, right? Mm, that no, that's 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 the Warring States period. I oh, think. that's the Warring States period. Yeah. Lubu, Lubu yeah, is earlier. Yeah, yeah you're right because nobody yeah. had guns; everybody was stabbing each other. Okay, yeah, this is this is that, but significantly Dynasty more messy. Warriors, that's the name. Yeah, 
this is yeah, this is uh, this this is the Kaiserreich special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. That that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, this is, by the way, uh, why we're bringing you on and we'll increasingly <laughs> have you on is because I attempted to do several stories about China and other parts of Southeast Asia and very quickly realized that like w- when I'm doing like Europe, you know, or, or or the United States or even parts of Latin America, just because it's a place I'm closer to and have spent more time in, I have like a certain base of historical understanding that I can build on. And I don't know anything about this, um, so I'm 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 fascinated and grateful to you for studying this part of the world for years and years. Yeah, well, okay, you know, here, here let me let me let me uh, let, let, let me resuscitate your reputation because mm-hmm. there there is something that you do, in fact, know significantly more about than I have. Uh, you have been in way more civil wars than I have. I, I have been in a couple <laughs> of civil wars. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run my, my simple model of the two kinds of civil wars past you. And we'll, we'll see what you think about it. Okay. Okay. So on the one hand, you have one kind of civil war where half the country starts fighting the other half. This is like the American uh-huh. civil war. You very yeah. rarely see this. And the other hand, you have civil wars where the whole country fragments into a million pieces and every single one of them starts fighting each other. Yeah. We so, call that doing a Syria. Yeah. Yeah. Or Yemen. Or Yemen. Or a lot of places. It's kind of the modern way of doing civil yeah. wars. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's also it's also what's going to happen in this period, except this war, like I, you know, when when I was looking at when I first looked at the control map, I my my brain shattered, and I've, I've never recovered since. And like I I I've never, I've never longed for the simplicity of the Yemeni civil war before. But this war, there are over a thousand warlords. In, 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 God. In, yeah, in, in the period between 1916 and 1928, they fight 700 different wars. That's that's too many different wars. Like, you it's, gotta, <laughs> if I was in there, what I would say is, like, we can cut that down to 200, 300 at the most. Like, I feel like I feel like I could have helped, like, consolidate the wars. What they needed was a consultant, a guy to be like, look. You guys are fighting the same war that these guys are fighting. Let's bundle that into one big war, and then we got less wars to deal with. It's my pitch. That's my pitch to China 150 <laughs> years ago. Right. I mean, look, I'm I'm all for it because it makes the history it would make it would have made the history like incomprehensibly easier. Like there are there, there are 20 pages of this script that's just me trying to explain two different factions taking and losing control of Beijing. That have that have mm-hmm. been they're just not here anymore because it's yeah this is this is this is maybe the messiest conflict I've ever encountered and we're about to dive into it yeah but first it's time for products and services you know what won't fragment China into hundreds of different warring quasi state militia things. These ads? Question mark. They will not. They will not. I feel. I feel <laughs> confident saying none of the people who advertise on our show have the kind of like flex to to destroy the Chinese state and launch a new civil war. Fair enough. Yeah. I. I just. I don't think the dick pill guys have that much weight to throw around. <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. Oh God. <laughs> God, okay, ads. We're back. All right. Let's get going. Okay, so be- before before we fully launch into this for reference purposes, we need to stop and do the briefest, most basic and most half-assed Chinese geography lesson in human history because this is the point where Chinese geography becomes very important in the story. So we're gonna we're look we're we're only gonna give you two cities. So I, th- I think we could do this. So at, at the very south of China, there is Hong Kong. Um, it's 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 control. Hong Kong is controlled by the British at this point. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's 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 separated basically from the province of Guangzhou, which is very south of China. Shanghai is kind of in the middle of China, north south wise, on the east coast, and then Beijing is further north of that, and then the very far north along the border with Korea is Manchuria. Um, and there's, you know, all of the different sort of Willard clicks in this period, because this, this, this whole thing is the greatest proof I've ever encountered. The high school never ends. <laughs> a, it's all clicks. B, all the clicks form for just incredibly petty reasons. Like one, one of the most powerful clicks 
a, a, a click that like takes Beijing and rules most of China for four years happened because one click of officers thought the other click wasn't promoting them fast enough. And and to make it worse, all of these people are classmates because they mm-hmm. all they all either went to sort of a military like a couple of military academies either in China or Japan. Yeah, this so is you, like I mean, this is the same as a lot of European history, to be honest. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just it's just it's high school with more guns, mm-hmm. which is fairly impressive considering how or many guns with high less school guns than an American high school to be. I, honest. <laughs> you know, the, these people have a lot of guns. <laughs> they, they do. Like it's it's yeah. it's pretty impressive. I was taking a cheap shot. Please, please continue. <laughs> so it's sort of unclear what Zhang was doing during the sort of revolutionary upheaval in 1911. Uh, all this is another thing with Zhang. Every account basically conflicts on what he was doing. What we know for sure is that by 1913, he ended up as a division commander in the army uh, stationed near Shanghai. But in 1913, the nationalists, who are known in the US as the KMT for reasons that piss me off to no end, but I will not get in here, uh, stage stage a disastrous revolt, and after after that revolt fails in sort of late 1913, John gets politically sidelined until the, the formal start of the warlord period. Now, another person sidelined after the failed 1913 revolution was the famous nationalist general, and this guy, like my mom had heard of this guy, and who had not heard of basically anyone else in the story except for the main character. So he's he's you know he's he's an important figure in 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 the KMT in the sort of the Nationalist Party. He's also an extremely important organized crime guy, and we will get into in the next episode why he's both a KMT general and a crime boss. Um, this man's name, Scans, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a wild story, but yeah, for for now, this guy's name is Chen Chi Mei. Um, when, when, when the Nationalist Revolt fails, Chen does something that I think Bastard's Pod re- listeners would recognize immediately. He flees to the early 1900s China's version of Mexico, which is Japan. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. dude. Good it, it's dude. It's great. Yeah. Solid. It, All right. Yeah. Japan, Japan just, it's, Japan is, it's, it's, it's literally just Mexico now. Um, you know, when, when you screw up in China and the army comes after you, you flee to Mexico and what, you flee, flee to Mexico or now you flee to Japan and you know, while you're in Japan, you have two choices. You can either just sort of live out your life quiet, quietly, or you can plot your triumphant return to China. And the second thing is what Chen ends up doing. Uh, in 1916, Chen saw, saw his opportunity and returns from Japan to Shanghai to start another revolution against the government. And this is where Zhang takes his first real action of the brave new world of warlordism. He has Chen assassinated, okay. which this, this has a number of sort of effects. One, it, the nationalists at this point just sort of crumple and they're not going to be a real political force for a while in China. The, the second important thing is that this is how Zhang gets his in with a couple of very, very powerful political patrons. Uh, the, the most important person here is this dude named Wu Pei Fu, who is also known as the Jade Marshal, who is, he is universally regarded as the warlord period's greatest strategist. And he, he, he runs one of the uh, warlord cliques and, you know, he, he rewards, Zhang for his loyalty and having this nationalist guy assassinated, and Zhang like moves up in the world really quickly. He he briefly becomes the vice president's personal bodyguard, and then eventually he, he he's he's given a new command in the army of his own. That's kind of um, random, no? Yeah, it's this whole period's politics. It, it's really weird because all basically all career advancement has to do with like which click you're able to please and so you know if you do something for one click they'll give you something and if you fail then they kick you out it's it's high school yeah it's high school <laughs> except yeah. a bunch of people are dying yeah or more people are dying i'm like the like american high school like robert yeah yeah mm-hmm. you know we're, we're look what i'm getting here we're all familiar with this <laughs> like we all we all understand the source material here yeah you all know right. Unfortunately, the, these people are incredibly fickle, and Chong managed to lose his entire army in, in an incredibly minor sort of border dispute war, and this gets him just kicked back into the political wilderness. Do they get killed, or do they just kind of like peace out from him? Uh, it's unclear. Th- this is one of those things where, so you know I was talking about there are 700 wars, right? Mm-hmm. So most of them, uh, this war, I can literally, the only reference I can find to its existence is that Zhang, like lost his army in it, but it, it's really unclear what happened and the, 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 so there's two stories of it one of them is that like they all died 
And then he goes back to Beijing and tries to bribe one of Wu Peifu's allies with just a bunch of these tiny golden lions to get another unit assigned to him. But okay. Wu Peifu finds out about this and kicks him out of the army. And, you know, okay, bribing a superior officer with a bunch of tiny golden lions is, like, exactly the kind of thing he would do. But, like, the sourcing's not good because, again, this, this man's life is just this incredible haze of stories. There, there's some other sources that say that so he loses his war, and then his army is absorbed into another warlord army, and then that warlord also subsequently loses a war and collapses. But either way, what we know is that he fleed sort of broken completely alone back to Manchuria in 1922. Okay. And, okay, this is, this is, this is the point where I have to make another brief announcement, which is that there are two completely unrelated dudes in the story named Zhang. Um, this is largely because one of the early Chinese dynasties essentially got pissed off. The people in villages didn't, like they were trying to tax, didn't have last names. And so they just came in and gave everyone last names. And yeah, and they have like a hundred of these names. These are called like the old 100 names. And they do this so they can get tax records, uh, get, get better tax records. And now every, like everyone in China has the same last name because they just wrote, force like, names on people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so two of the main characters in this, in this have the same name is what you're telling me. Yeah, so so okay. there's two big Zhongs. If, if I just say <laughs> Zhong, I'm talking about our hero Zhang Zhongchang, who is the dog meat warlord. Uh, okay. The second Zhong is the guy we're going to meet now, whose name is Zhang Zhuling. Um, he's the warlord of Manchuria. If I talk about him, I'll say his full name, or okay. I'll just say his last name, so there's no confusion. Um, un- unfortunately for all of history and for us trying to get through the story, the, the, like basically the moment he gets to Manchuria, Zhang decides to try to join Zhu Ling's army. And this is another one of those things. That there's a very weird story here, which is... So his attempt to get into the army seems to be that Zhu Ling throws this massive birthday party for himself because, you know, okay, so if you're a warlord, right? Like, yeah, you're going to have some pretty wild ass birthday parties for sure. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, what, what is else is the point of being a warlord? If you yeah, don't, no, if that you, doesn't even require explanation. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now the weird part about this, so everyone else shows up to it. And, okay. So we're, we're meeting the warlord, right? You show up to a birthday party with incredibly expensive gifts. Zhang just doesn't show up at all. What he does instead is he sends these two empty coolie baskets, which are those like, you know, those baskets that. Yeah, that are being carried. Like a coolie is like what the British called dudes in India. They would pay to carry shit for them. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. Baskets and, people carry mm-hmm. shit in. Yeah, they yeah. have like, there's like a pole that you hang them off yeah. of. They're, they're, there's a lot of people use them in China. So mm-hmm. Zhang just like gives him these two empty baskets. And Zhu Ling is extremely confused by this because you know, okay, this guy doesn't show up to my birthday party and then just gives two baskets. Yeah, kind of a weird flex for the warlord <laughs> whose army you want to be in. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, apparently, though, if, what, what Zhang appears to have been implying and what Zhu Ling, like, somehow figures out through the powers of deductive reasoning that I don't have and I don't understand, but apparently what Zhang is saying is that the baskets are empty to, to represent that he would shoulder any burden that Zhu Ling would give him. Which is weird, but this actually oh, works. Okay. That's, but that's like a weird, like he's doing symbolism shit. Okay. Yeah, I, but you know, th- this works and Zhang like, is given a minor post in the army, which, you know, I, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. Um, and really fortunately for Zhang, a few months later, there's, there's, there's a revolt in Manchuria and Zhang is the person who puts it down. Mm-hmm. And for that, he's given a much, like a... I don't know. I don't know if field grades like the right term for this, but he's he's given like a, a fairly he senior position. Yeah, he gets yeah. a huge promotion, and this 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 one decision is going to turn Zhang from a minor military commander into the most feared and despised warlord in all of China. That makes sense. Yeah, and you know this this sucks for the rest of China, but for Zhu Ling, this is this promotion turns out to be an incredibly good idea. Um, in in 1922. Zhu Ling brings Zhang with him to negotiate with a group of Russian emigres who become trapped in Mongolia when the country had gained independence from China in 1921, and were trying to get out because Mongolia had just aligned itself with the USSR, and these Russians were former members of the pro Tsarist White Army, which, as, 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 as we know from the show, had been defeated by the, the, the combined efforts of great hero, pod alum, Nestor Machno's anarchist Black Army, mm-hmm. and the Bolshevik Red Army in the Russian Civil War. So there's, there's a bunch of these Russian dudes in Mongolia. And because Zhang's incredibly fluent in Russian, he's able to just sort of extract them and convince, them, convince these people to work for him. And 
this is where Jong starts building up the core of what's going to be a very dangerous and incredibly formidable army. Um, he's, he gains about is like three thousand Russian infantry infantrymen who are you know they're, they're well trained but you know they're just sort of infantrymen. The big deal here is that he gets one thousand Russian cavalrymen who armed with lances, your favorite Mauser pistols, and these just enormous mm-hmm. fuck off swords become basically just the backbone of Jong's new army. Yeah, and these guys are Cossacks, basically, right? Uh, I don't, I don't actually think they're Cossacks. Oh, okay. I, I, so I they're think just they're like just Russian cavalry, then. Yeah, I, I think they're, I think they're just regular Russian cavalry, which is you know still just absolutely no, terrifying. Yeah. Like, yeah, like these people have just fought through the Russian Civil War, which is like one of the worst wars in history. Yeah, and they've been through they some horrifying it. shit, yeah. and they're just yeah, they're just a bunch of like broken, dangerous monsters. Yep. And every yeah. every everyone in China is terrified of them, and all the accounts are like kind of racist about it. But it's like yeah, like okay, if if you were confronted with a group of people who like have been killing continuously for like ten years now, and like who probably read the Protocols of the Elder Zion to their children as bedtime stories, like <laughs> I too would be afraid. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that, yeah. That, they sound. T- Terrifying. I'm yeah. certain they were. Um, they probably have a couple of ethnic cleansings under their belt oh, by the time yeah. they get to China. <laughs> yep. Now, the White Russians also importantly bring another piece of technology from the Russian Civil War: armored trains. Oh um, hell yeah! yeah. Uh, There's a great nah, armored train stuff here. There is not a goddamn thing I love more in the world than a good armored train story. Yeah, there's there's some oh, man. I, I sadly I can't get into the full thing here, but there's one of these trains is absolutely wild like one of these trains was like a train that the czech legion had taken to like flee so they'd, they'd like taken it across half of russia to like flee and it ends up in the hands of the japanese and then john gets a hold of it here and then he starts incorporating it to his army and this is also great because so the the, the, the chinese warlord period this is like the other great armored train war other than the russian civil war now these trains these trains are and they they perform extremely well in this war which is sort of weird because normally they don't perform that great because they have this problem where like, okay, so if you just cut the tracks in front of them, they're kind of useless. Yeah, but, that is know, the downside of trains. Yeah, but but you know when when they don't do this, you, you, what you get essentially is a troop transport, a tank, and an artillery battery roll up into one, and this combined with the Russian cavalry makes Zhang's army incredibly fast and. This speed gives them like an, just a really deadly edge against the sort of slower and worse trained warlord armies that are going to sort of serve Zhang well in the upcoming war. Now, okay, we've talked about the right Russian cavalry. We've talked about the armored trains. So I think it's time we induce we introduce Zhang's third secret weapon, the baby squads. Okay, all right. I'm 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 excited to hear about this. Yeah, so the baby squads are Zhang's special army of child soldiers who are commanded by his son, who is also a child. Now, when we say (laughs) child, are we talking like garrison child or are we talking like child ass child? You know, know, so the estimates vary on this. They they seem to have been in their early teens. Okay, okay, like 14, 15? Well, like 11. They go, they go, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, you know. But you child, know, it's just child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of them are child, child. Some of them are like older tweens. Yeah, and you know, it, what's interesting about them though is so they they get their own like incredibly fancy uniforms, and they get trained with these. Uh, Jong has custom made German rifles that can be handled by children, like imported. Like he 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 breaks a weapons embargo. To get these custom made German rifles that children can use. I mean, you know, you know what I always say: if you're going to arm children, you gotta go with German guns. Nobody knows arming small children and sending them into war like the Germans. You know, that's just yeah. that's just historical fact. Yeah, qual- yeah, you, you have historical experience combined with quality craftsmanship. I mean, they just got through a war that with where they participated in a battle called the Slaughter of the Innocents because they sent so many children off to die. <laughs> you know, I, 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 they're the right people to go to for yeah. child rifles, is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, it's a good choice, and and you know, I okay. So interestingly, so I, I, as best I can tell, the Baby Squad is sort of just like a pet project that John gives to his like teenage son, but. They're, you know, by all accounts, they're extremely well paid and well fed, which makes them one of like three units in Zhang's entire army that is like paid on time and fed. So 
you know, like to to be fair to Zhang, also the, every like literally every faction in this war is also using child soldiers, and it, it it's notable that Zhang spends like a huge amount of effort trying to like kick people out of his army who he doesn't think are fit to fight. So like in, in 1925, he he kicks like thirty thousand troops out of his army for either being bandits, bad soldiers, or just like being too old or too young. Yeah, that is um, that's a lot of. That that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is another thing. These armies, the warlord armies, are massive. Like, and and you know, they, and they they, they kind of swell during when battles are happening. As sort of this like mass conscription, they like recruit bandit groups. But like, I mean, there, there are battles in this war where there's there's there are single battles with four hundred thousand troops. Like this is, yeah, yeah. But and you know, but but somehow the baby squads never get cut up in this downsizing, and so they they seem to have been there until the end of the war, which. You know, I, all in all, it, it's not the worst use of child soldiers I've ever seen, but it's also not mm-hmm. the best. So, Chung Chung Chung, mid level child soldier user. Yeah, okay. That seems good. I mean, you know, look, look, it's, we've always said on this show, it, it, using children to fight wars for you is as much an art as it is a science, you know? And it sounds like he was pretty good at the science part, but maybe he could have been a little bit more artful in his yeah. use of miners as as death troopers, for sure. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Pobody's nerfect, you know? You know, it, it's, it's speaking of that, though, right? Like, we're, we're going to get... In, here's something... All right, we're, I'm, I'm going to attempt to redeem Jong after his child soldier army. So this is also the point in the story when Jong's mother reappears. And it's not clear if they'd, like, found each other sometime in between, like... When, when when she was sold off for grain and when he joined the army. But by, by 1922, they've reunited and Zhang just like he he like loves his mom. Like they 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 literally travel everywhere together. Like every time he goes out to the field, she's on the train, he just like lavishes her with gifts and meals and attention and you know, and she she lives out the rest of her life in luxury. So, you know, good good for her. She deserves it. It's take care of your mama for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of a, a shame how her son turned out, question mark. I mean, look, you know, you, you don't you don't make a happy mom omelet without breaking a couple of other people's children eggs. Yeah. Yeah. And and really, what are other people's children but fodder for the baby squads? Well, I mean, the, the benefit of using children as your soldiers is that it's very easy to make more children. Yeah. People it's, have it's, been doing it for forever. Yeah, it, it's like it's it's like cutting down trees when they're when they're young. Yeah, you just plant more trees. Yeah, that's why we have so many trees. Yeah. So so in 1924, a war starts between Wu Peifu and his clique, which is based out of Beijing, and Zhang Shuling's clique, which is based out of Manchuria. And this begins a massive series of set piece battles on what is the greatest set piece on earth, the Great Wall of China. And this whole war is fought along, like, this is the famous part of the Great Wall. Like, this is, this is, this is the part you've all seen pictures of. It, it's the part that was built by the Ming Dynasty to keep the Manchus contained in Manchuria. Um, you know, and, and this means that in order to get from Beijing to Manchuria, and Zhang Zhongchang is in Manchuria attempting to invade Beijing, you have to go through one of these sort of very small number of heavily guarded passes. And it's these passes that the Great Wall of China was sort of built to fortify. So each of their armies sort of mass on their respective side of the Great Wall, and they try, they try to prepare to force away the fight, to, for, to sort of force their way through the passes. Now, while everyone else was fighting this just like incredibly bloody, pointless stalemate at one of the largest passes, Zhang moves up to attack another smaller pass, hoping to sort of flank Wu Peifu's army. And Zhang immediately realizes the pass is way under defended and just storms his way through it. But realizing that he was just sort of alone on Wu Peifu's side of the mountain, he, he, he sits in the entrance and he waits for his chance to strike. And that chance is going to come after what I can, I can only describe as absolute clown shit from one of Wu Peifu's subordinates, costs him everything. So an, another very crucial mountain pass is held by the worst commander in Wu Peifu's army, this is a guy, yeah, this is a guy who, he's a general, but he's been given a general just, like, because his, his, his brother is the president. Now, Wu's assumption is that this pass, it is literally impossible to screw up defending, defending it, because it's narrow and there's an artillery unit. And so Wu puts the artillery unit there, assuming, that, okay, if anyone comes to the pass, just blow them up with artillery. 
And Wu's, Wu looks at this guy and is like, okay, so we need to keep him out of the fighting because you put him anywhere where he can command troops, he's going to screw everything up. So we're going to put him in this pass. It'll be fine. You can't possibly not, not hold it. This would become the single greatest mistake of Wu Peifu's entire career. His quote-unquote general, and I'm using this term incredibly loosely, develops this like incredibly elaborate scheme where he's going to send his troops through the pass to lure the enemy army back through it so that he can shell the enemy army after luring them in. You know, this is like, if you've studied any military history at all, it's like, okay, this plan is incredibly convoluted. There's no way it's going to work. Right. What happens instead is that Wu Peifu's general's troops, okay, so they go out and they retreat back into the pass. But this guy mistakes his troops for the enemy and kills them all with his own artillery. Excellent. Solid generalship. Yeah, 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 it's hell great, yeah. great stuff. And the, the guy on, the other, on the, the other side of the pass, the commander on the other side of the pass is a guy named Han. And Han watches his opponent blows, blowing up his entire army, rips his shirt off, and just like charges into the pass, bare-chested into yeah. the pass, his minefield. Now, between four and 5,000 of Han's troops die in this attack. But... By, by what I can only describe as just a, an actual act of God, Han just, like, survives this. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is, he, he disappears into the fabric of history, having won a war by just doing a parody of Dude's Rock by charging shirtless into a minefield. Yeah, he just fucking Leroy Jenkins his yeah. way to victory. Absolutely. <laughs> it's incredible. And what happens next? So, so Wu Pei Fu hears about this charge and is like, okay, this moron's charging through the pass. It's fine. We have the artillery unit there. What he doesn't know is that the artillery has used all of their ammo shelling their own troops. So Han's troops take the pass and the rest of Zhang Zhuling's army just floods through the Great Wall. And it's at this moment where Wu Pei Fu is betrayed by one of his subordinates and everything falls apart. And so Wu Pei Fu makes, he makes one last desperate attempt to sort of like regroup. And for, for a very brief moment, it looks like this is going to work. But unfortunately for him, Zhang Zhongcheng sees his, sees his chance. He's been, he's been sitting on the other side of this pass for the whole battle, and he sees his chance. And he makes an, he, he launches an attack that splits Wu Peifu's remaining army in half, and with just a single attack, ends Wu Peifu's career. Or, you know, okay. So this is what you would think would happen in a normal war when you lose your entire army, all of your territory, and all of your political support collapses. However... <laughs> Welcome to the Warlord period, where the rules are made up, the points don't matter, and Wu Pei Fu somehow, after literally losing everything, will be back in part two. It's, <laughs> oh, God, this whole war. I mean, hell yeah. Why not? It's Look, great. I, it, it, I, I don't believe in this cancel culture bullshit. So, look, if I, I feel like as a warlord, you're not really getting good until you've lost two or three armies, right? Yeah. You just You gotta, you gotta... You got to, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's like riding a bike, right? You're going to fall a couple of times. You're going to lose a couple of armies. You're going to get tens of thousands of people killed. Like that's just, you know, there's no avoiding it. Yeah. And you know, the, the product of this is that if, if you look at the full history of this period, like it, it's basically a comic book plot. Like there, there are dozens of characters who lose everything and then reappear and lose everything because just no one no one ever dies until you see a body and even then like <laughs> yeah it's like a marvel movie yeah 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 it's it's incredible except it, it's somehow less coherent yeah 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 i mean and it's one of those things the lesson here about all these guys who lose everything repeatedly and keep coming back to lose more things and then some cases eventually win is that what determines winners and losers in history is that the the winners lose just as often as the losers, but they have no shame about it. It's true. And you got to keep that in mind. So never ask about how your actions affect other people. Um, use them as tools and walk into the pages of history like this guy. Yeah, and the, the, the other really important thing here, betray your allies at the first opportunity. Oh yeah, that goes all without the saying, people. For sure. All of the people who do well in this war immediately betray all of their friends, and mm -hmm. they you know get who, they get you rewarded know who for who won't it. betray their friends. I don't. I actually cannot. I mean, verify. I, I, I absolutely verify, will, though. Sophie, because <laughs> as soon as the dogs in your house barked, I threw you under the bus. You know, um, that's mean. I, that's why I'm successful, Sophie. Throwing my friends under the bus, but you know who I won't throw under the bus. <laughs> The products and services that support this podcast until they stop supporting this podcast, at which point they're dead to me.
We're back. All right. What else we got? Now, Jong makes out like a bandit from this war. Mm -hmm. So in in late. He is is a bandit. Oh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) he is now the supreme bandit, which is really what being a warlord is. You know, he, he tries to take Shanghai in sort of late 1924, but another warlord gets there first, and they do this really awkward dance where both of them occupy parts of the city, and everyone in Shanghai is like, oh god, they're going to fight a battle here, please go fight somewhere else, don't destroy our precious city. And so eventually, like, and, and th- th- this winds up involving a bunch of foreign governments, and there's this huge set of negotiations, and eventually they, the, the two warlords work out an agreement where they're both going to pull out of the city. Now, the other warlord abides by the agreement and pulls his army out. Zhang just doesn't leave. He just stays there and occupies the city. And, you know, so several months into 1925, he, he finally gets an order to leave Shanghai. But he's only, he's only sort of convinced to leave the city after he's given full control of his home province of Shandong, as well as the really, frankly, delightful title that we should bring back Bandit extermination commander. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> I like it. Yeah, he gets that for like a couple other provinces, and and it, it's it's in this moment as he as he sort of takes Shanghai and is given control of his home province of Shandong that he really becomes the dog meat general. Now, Zhang was never like the best dude, even before he was given absolute power over an entire province and an enormous fuck off army. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it, to to repurpose the old anti Nixon song. Power corrupts, we know that by heart, but you have to admit, Jong had a head start. <laughs> and and right. just, just the moment she takes real power, she goes wild. And one of the immediate products of this is he just starts collecting just this unbelievable pile of nicknames. Uh, his most famous is Guro Jing, or the Dog Meat General, a title he gains because of his reputation for playing a Chinese gambling game. It's like domino based. And for some indescribable reason, people in Manchuria call this game eating dog meat. Okay. I, I don't know why this is like the, the, the best I could come up with is that one of the words kind of sounds like dog, but who knows now? Now, confusingly, I've also seen claims that he did actually eat dog meat because he thought it would make him more virile, but Good the, dogs do fuck a lot for sure. Yeah, but you know, the sourcing on this is not great and, and it's it has no relation to why he's called the dog meat general. So I just want to make it clear he's called the dog meat general because this dude he spends so much time gambling. Like half the descriptions of him that you read are just like from some diplomat or from like some high society person who just ran into him at a gambling den. Now, I'm I'm just gonna read out his list of the rest of his nicknames because like Lord Almighty, this dude has more nicknames than any other person I've ever heard of. Okay, his nicknames. The Tiger, Big Tongue, Blue Sky, The Dragon, The well, no, Red okay. Bearded Bandit. Big Tongue. We, we, we gotta... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna have to take a second here. Why, why, why Big Tongue? Uh, half of these, I have no idea. Okay. Like, it, it's really weird. He just... Every, every source has, like, a different thing of nicknames. Um. Yeah, we're, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll explain some of them. He, yeah, he has the dragon. I think the dragon is because he has this, like the the I don't know. He he has he has some sort of complicated relationship to the dragon emperor that we're who's a mythological figure we're going to get to in a little bit. Um, he's called Wait, the what? red. Start that start that list again. The tiger, big tongue, blue sky, the dragon, the red bearded bandits, the monster, the lanky the lanky general, the three dozen nose warlord. 72 Cannon Jong, the general with three long legs, old 86, oh, and the long legged general. Yeah, okay, we're going to get to that part in a second. But so his, his second most famous nickname. I mean, it sounds nickname, like he fucks from those nicknames. Yeah. It sounds like he fucks. Yeah. Okay, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do this. Okay, so old 86, that one. Yeah, so you, 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 as you've gathered, three of these are, the last three of these ones are just about his dick. Um, Old 86 yes. is the most interesting one because supposedly it's because his dick is as long as a stack of 86 Mexican silver pesos. That's amazing. Now, because <laughs> that, that just brings up so many questions because we're again in China. So okay. why is the peso anyone's go to for the size of this guy's dick? So, so Mexican silver pesos have long been used in hard currency in China dating back to the 1500s oh. when the Ming's well, insatiable me. demand for silver formed the, 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 the base of the Ming currency system that results in them 
importing a huge amount of the silver that that's that's removed from Spanish controlled mines in Latin America. So yeah, Ming Dynasty, uh, they do great things for quality of life, are also kind of responsible for all the genocides in Latin America. Not great. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. I mean it, to, to be fair, they didn't know where it was coming from, but <laughs> Yeah, they just needed to measure people's dicks. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so as, as sort of various currencies collapse in the warlord period, people keep using Mexican silver, like pesos, as coins that are just worth their weight in silver. I'm, I'm just, I'm still, I'm, I'm still working through in my head the, wow, the boss has a huge dick. Hey, get some of that silver. I want to, yeah. I want to <laughs> figure out exactly how yeah. this dick shakes out in pesos. So, so one of my, one of my friends who has experience with Mexican coins from this period calculated that 86 pesos stack on top of each other means that this dude's dick is 8.8 inches long. Okay. That's, which, that's, that's believable. Yeah. yeah. And you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that like you'd expect. Okay. This is like the kind of myth making you'd expect to get from warlords, but like, stunningly this like seems to be true yeah i mean eight eight point six inches if we're if he was like yeah he's got like a 14 15 inch dick i'd be like okay well this sounds like some some rasputin nonsense but 8.6 is like yeah it's a pretty good sized dick but that's not like we're not yeah. talking outside of the realm of possibility here especially yeah. for a dude as big as this yeah, guy. Like 8.6 <laughs> inches for a near seven feet is just kind of like yeah, that sounds like sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, and he, you know, as 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 you, as you guess, this dude just fucks all the time. I yes, yeah. I, I had gathered that from his nicknames. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the tongue one is about fucking too. Yeah, I think so. Um, the there, there's another one that's like famous, which is about uh, the three doesn't knows general, which is because so so <laughs> his his most famous quote is that he doesn't know. How many? He doesn't know how many troops he has. He doesn't know how much money he has, and he doesn't know how many women he's having sex with at any given moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's the most warlord shit ever. I mean, you're not making being a warlord sound like a bad gig. Yeah, you know, and, and this 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 seems like as good a time as any to mention that this is the period where Jong starts traveling around with special train cars for his forty two concubines. The names of okay. which he just didn't know and thus referred yeah, to well, by I mean, assigned number. Concubines. Yeah. Yeah. You're a warlord. I don't expect you to know anyone's name. Yeah. You know, it, you know, so, so con- contrary to Zhang, I spent a pretty good amount of time trying to figure out who these women were. Mm-hmm. And there's just, well, that a, is nice. Of you. There, there's just like a really depressing lack of interest in these women's lives, just like across the whole academic literature. What I was able to find out about them was that like, half of them are Russians who came with the White Army, and the rest of them are either sort of Chinese, Japanese, or American. But we don't really know how John got his, got his hands on them. Yeah, these are a lot of foreign ladies. Yeah, that he's got, huh? yeah, and th- that that's like one of the big things that all of the sort of like media people pick up on is like, wow, he has like white prostitutes, and it's like, okay. Oh yeah, I'm sure that makes the news back in New York. Yeah, yeah. Now, I it's possible that some of these people had been sex workers in Shanghai, but it's also possible that Zhang's troops and the White Russians do this literally all the time. Uh, just literally like grab them off the street at random because you know if 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 this the you know, this we're starting to get into the downside of the boiler period, which is that like yeah, so if you're like a woman like a woman in the street of China, someone can just like grab you off the street and yeah. you're a concubine now, but. You know, and what I think is really depressing about this is, is like, like we don't know what the relationship to him was. Um, all of the sources, they don't even agree as to like, like half of the sources call them concubines and half of them call them wives. And like, we don't know if they're there against their will. We don't know if they're getting paid. We just, we don't know anything about them. And it's incre- extremely frustrating, especially because Chung appears to have had kids with some of these women, but we don't know what happened to them. We don't know what happened to the women. We don't know what happened to the kids. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of other very weird stuff here. I, I, I saw some evidence that some of the dudes that Zhang was sleeping with were men, which implies that, like, he's bi. But again, this is one of those things. I mean, and also, you, when you're that kind of powerful person, it's almost less about sexuality and more about just, like, power. Like, yeah, you just fuck yeah. people because they can't not fuck you because you're the warlord. I think that is some of these dudes, like... It's almost not worth kind of trying to box them into a, a sexual category. It's kind of like how 
rape is less about sex than about power for yeah. this kind of person who power is everything for. It's just like he kind of he just fucks. Yeah, and, and there, there's a sort of interesting consequence of this, which is that like if you look at like Jung's life, he he kind of just turns into this just like like physical embodiment of structural forces. It's like, okay, so like, what is the patriarchy, right? It's like, well, here is this dude whose whole thing is that he like, he literally physically reduces women to numbers. And you, you, you get this with sort of in, in various different ways with like state violence, like the banking system where like a lot of what Zhang sort of reveals is that it's just all of these systems are just a dude with a lot of guns. And yeah. if you, yeah, you know, if you just give, I mean, like, a like random look, dude we're, ta- guns, we're, we're watching shit go down in Gaza right now. Yeah. All of the systems today are still just dudes with guns. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we really, dress it up more and less. But. Yeah. Well, the, the, and the, really the only difference between it is, is the amount of legitimacy you have. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and th- you know, th- and this legitimacy problem is like, this is a big thing for all of the warlords and Chong just doesn't try to solve it. <laughs> which is what makes him unique. Everyone else is doing this like, oh, I do, I plant gardens, I, I do public works. And Zhang's just like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have fun. Now, yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, the, the consequence of this though is while, while Zhang's like jet-setting around with a train full of like maybe sex slaves, uh, what's happening in Shandong, the province just been had to control over is... Oh boy. Um, so, some of it is pretty funny. Like, so... He, he, when when he leaves his office every day when he's in Shandong, he he has like all the streets cleared, and then he has a bunch of people like sprinkle clean water on the road to prepare prepare like prepare it for him to walk on, which is just like this is some great petty dictator shit. Like yeah, <laughs> yep. And he also you know he he does a thing a lot of dictators do, which is he starts issuing his own paper currency. Hell yeah, hell yeah, has his face on it. Well, so this is I, I couldn't find much about it because, and the reason. Is for this is she just gets bored of it and stops printing it <laughs> and then after that she starts making everyone use military stamps as money oh man i you know <laughs> i'm on board with 80 percent of this guy everything but the probable rape really yeah um, you know and, and, I, and i think this is this is this is what puts him like the fact that he's not using his own currency that he's using military stamps this is, this is like what puts him like a tier above the rest of the warlords because the rest of the warlords is like ah whatever i'll i'll, I'll print my own money but jong's like Okay, so these stamps are made in Manchuria, which means I don't have to pay for them. I just get sent them. Mm-hmm. So so if, if I use these stamps as money, I don't have to like spend the money to like make your own fake paper currency. Hey, look, you don't you don't get an army, lose an army and then get another army and then lose another army and then get another army unless you're pragmatic. Yeah. And you know, and we, we can we can see some examples of his pragmatism. So there's a, there's a famous story of like at one point a merchant is just like these are stamps. This is not money. So Jong has a dude taken out of his shop, uh, beaten and shot. Which you know, funnily enough, this is how states forced originally forced people to use money, and it like worked because yeah, yeah, it's like money 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 do? is the thing that like when when the state asks you for it, you have to give them like, like give it to them. Yep. Yeah, and he also, so the other thing he starts doing in this period is he starts uh, going to banks and just like pulling out guns and telling them to give him loans, which... Yeah, that's, I mean, I, look, I, I am currently in the process of wanting to buy a house, but a lifetime of shit credit uh, is making that difficult. And I might do the same thing. That <laughs> seems like a pretty good idea, yeah, to be this honest. Is, th- this is one of his best ideas, and it's great because like, he... I will pay the loan, but I am going to get it at gunpoint. Yeah. His fucking credit. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, and the, the, funny part, the other funny part about this, he, so there's like a bunch of banks in Shandong that have been open for like 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 a lot, like a couple hundred years, and he drives like six of them out of business because he just like takes oh, yeah. all of their money and loans. Well, unfortunately, now we have to come to the really bad stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've been having fun, but uh, oh boy, I hate it when people do this to me because I normally do this to people. Uh, yeah, huh. it only took us like fourteen pages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one one of the most famous accounts of what's happening in Shandong from this Shandong from this period comes from a guy named Joseph Stillwell. Who okay, I need to mention at the outset, Stillwell, enormous racist, huge piece of shit. 
Um, he's a white guy in China in this yeah. period. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you, you naturally didn't need to tell me. Yeah, but like, like naturally, because he's incredibly racist and a piece of shit, uh, he goes on to be an incredibly important American general in World War II who fights in the like the China and India theater. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So that's great. He's like still beloved in the U.S. for reasons. Mm-hmm. But you know, yep. his, his account, right. his account of it like matches with other stuff I've seen. So I thought I'd start with that. So, so Stillwell's there. Stillwell's in Shandong in 1927, uh, and what what he describes is these huge swaths of the population made homeless by war, huddling together desperately in packed city streets without even a tent to shelter them at night. Bodies began to pile up on the streets, but there was no one to take them away, and the corpses stayed where they fell as famine ravaged the province. Zhong's solution, if it can be called that, to the, this problem of famine is industrial waste. So one of Manchuria's chief exports in this period were soybean cakes, which is it's basically like it's it's a bunch of mass of soybean that's been smushed together. And, and I want to say at the outset, so when I call these cakes, right, these are cakes in the sense that like cakes of uranium are cakes. Mm-hmm. Like they're not food. This this is an this is an industrial product. And you know, what you do with them with them is that you, you know, you you ship you ship them somewhere else and then you squeeze the oil out of them. And that that oil is used to make like it's it's used in a, like a number of like important industrial processes. And what what it leaves behind is this even worse, like quote unquote, cake. That's it's it's waste material. They, people use it as fertilizer. Some use it to feed pigs. And mm-hmm. this is what Zhang starts to import from Manchuria and use to feed the refugees. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good like, dude. Like I need to reiterate this. This is not food. This is an yeah, industrial waste product. <laughs> it, it's edible in the sense that it will fill your stomach and temporarily stop hunger pangs without actually providing you with nutrition well and, and it might just poison you because again like and, yeah, these things I mean, are being just taken from a factory right yeah. like you know and, and out of this is this is this is what's happening to the people that he's trying to help the people that he's not trying to help so the, the, I, I think that the best way to sort of understand how brutal his army is in this period is that Everywhere his army goes, it, it starts to change the lig- the language of the provinces, because every time they find a new way to murder someone, it gets popular. Like people have to come up with a new term for it. So, mm-hmm. for example, one of the one of the things in the beginning of this is there, there's an expression that becomes popular called to cut apart to catch the light, which means like taking a skull, splitting it in two, and like exposing the insides of it to the sun. Okay. Yeah, and you know, but the thing is, like that, 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 you know, you, you, you split, you split enough skulls, and it's like, okay, whatever. And so the troops get bored, and when they got bored with that, they come up with another one, which is they would split skulls in half, like fully clean in half, and then they, they'd find a telephone pole that's like connected by a wire to another telephone pole, and they'd hang the skulls on each end of the telephone pole at opposite ends of the wire, with their ears like pressed up to the, to the things that looked like they were listening to the telephone. And this becomes so widespread, the phrase he'd been made to listen to the telephone becomes like another popular expression in the province. Jesus, that's dark. Horrible. Yeah. It's, you know, th- this whole reign of terror became known as the steel sword policy after Zhang's policy of just decapitating his political opponents and splitting their heads with swords. And, and when I say- Yeah, that one's pretty straightforward. Yeah, but, but you know, when I say this is his policy, right? I mean, he is literally personally doing this. Like, he is the guy holding the sword, chopping people's skulls open. Yeah, he's a man of action. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and when, when, you're, when, you're, when, when you're six foot seven and you have a bunch of really sharp swords, like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can- you Look, can I mean, skulls. again, he's making a lot of calls I, too, would make in his situation. Yeah. And there's, you know, there, there's, there's, I, 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 think, I think you will also appreciate this one as a member of the press- uh, so very early on, when he first start, takes power, uh, one, of, one of the earliest instances of the, sort of the steel sword policy is there's an editor of a newspaper who like publishes an article criticizing him. And, oh, that's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So Zhang has the newspaper editor dragged out of his office and shot in the street. And then like, you know, after that, all the newspapers sort of stop criticizing him. Mm-hmm. Now, I, and I, I should mention this. What Zhang and his men are doing here is not just random violence. Zhang has the same legitimacy problem that every other warlord does. And his solution to it is essentially just to cut the Gordian knot and kill anyone who opposes him in ways so public and so violent that no one would ever dare do it again. Okay. And this has a devastating effect on the population in Shandong. The effects of constant warfare, bandits, droughts, and locusts combined with the sheer brutality of Zhang's extraction of wealth to leave four to nine million people, like including my family, by the way, who are, who are in this province uh, in, in the period uh, on the oh, brink rad. of starvation. 
which luckily most and that, of, that part's not rad you know what yeah I was. but you know well it's nice to have a family connection to a story yeah yeah i discovered it in the middle and like we, we have some records from that period and i was like i'm not gonna read these <laughs> like i'm just not yeah it seems like it would be pretty dark. yeah yeah and so while, while the masses ate fertilizer to stay alive Jong was partying with an endless succession of local sycophants who laughed at his every word for a chance to turn a chunk of his favor into a chunk of his stolen wealth. He was gambling, fucking constantly, just completely wasted literally all the time. Like, driving around with this, like, pers- personalized yeah. Belgian dining set and his personalized train with a bunch of women taken from, like, who knows where. He's having, having the absolute time of his life. Yeah. And that, that's the image I'm going to leave you with today. Chung Zong Chung living out his wildest being dreams. being a king. Yeah. Mm-hmm. While the people of China died in droves around him. And in part two, we're going to see what happens when an increasingly out of touch ruling class leads his people to die and murder them in the streets when they protest. Because in part two, those ordinary people are going to start to fight back. Well, that's, that's your footboots, Robert. <laughs> I was off the internet for a while. Look. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Well, Chris, this has been a great episode. Um, I'm still more on this guy's side than not because I love me a warlord. Um, and it sounds like he's doing um, he's doing the right thing, right? He's he's living it up, committing horrible crimes against humanity, drunk off his ass, just 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 being a being a king about it. So I don't know. I'm excited to see where this guy goes. Yeah. Yep. And Do we have any pluggables to plug? Yeah, so I guess I'm I'm it me chr three or the Isense Be Destroyed dude on Twitter. Um Yeah, I, I have a substack called uh the long twenty first century, which I, I I swear I do occasionally post to it and then I'm also not a turf. And yeah. Great. Great. Alright. Well we will be back with more of this guy. And more um, uh, 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 horrible war crimes? I'm going to guess more horrible war yeah. crimes, Chris. Yeah. If anything, All they right. get worse. Yeah. Well, awesome. check in for that. And remember, if you're going to be a warlord, you kind of got to go all the way. 